Greetings and welcome to Intermediate Algebra, Rational Expressions, and Rational Functions. Lesson 5.6, Applications. Let's work with the following example of an application problem. One number is twice another. The sum of their reciprocals is 2. Let's find the number. So I'm just going to say one number is an x. The other number is a y, and we'll see how far that gets us. Well, one number, x, equals twice the other number. So we know x equals 2y, and well, y just equals y. And each of these values have reciprocals. The reciprocal of x is 1 over x. And the reciprocal of y is 1 over y. We also know, since x equals 2y, the reciprocal of x will also equal 1 over 2y. Okay, so we have our reciprocals. The sum of the reciprocals is 2. So if we add the two reciprocals, 1 over 2y plus 1 over y, that will equal 2. Now we need to solve for y. And if you remember, we're going to multiply by the LCD. In this case, the LCD is 2y. So let's multiply everything by 2y. Okay. 2y times 1 is 2y, and that's 2y over 2y plus 2y times 1 is 2y over y equals, well, 2y times 2 is 4y. We can reduce some of this. 2y over 2y, well, 2y goes into 2y once, and 2y goes into 2y once, so that's just a 1. Okay. 1 plus, well, y goes into y once, and y goes into y once, and 2 times 1 is 2. That's 1 plus 2 equals 4y. So 3 equals 4y. And therefore, we're going to divide by 4, divide by 4. y equals 3 fourths. Now that we know what y is, we can solve for x. We can plug in what y is and say that x equals 2 times 3 fourths. And again, I can reduce. Four goes into four, uh, 2 goes into 4 twice, 2 goes into 2 once, and therefore x equals 1 times 3 is 3 over 2. So our two numbers are 3 halves, and three-fourths. Let's try another problem. This time, let's say two families are uh, from the same neighborhood and they are taking a ski trip together. The first family is driving a newer car and uh, makes the 455-mile trip at a speed of five miles per hour faster than the second family who is driving an older car. The second family takes a half an hour longer to make the trip. What are the speeds of the two families? One of the first things we need to figure out is what's the important information that we need to be able to solve this problem? There's a lot of information that's in this problem that we don't care about. Uh, we don't care that they're from the same neighborhood and we don't care that they're going to ski trip together. We don't even care if one vehicle is newer than the other. That has no bearing on solving 
what speeds they were traveling at. So here's what's important. The distance they drew, they drove 455 miles. That's important. The speeds at what they traveled, well, the fact that one speed was five miles per hour than the other is important. It's also important that one of the families took a half an hour longer to make the same trip. That's the important information here. The rest of it, at least to solve what we're looking for, is irrelevant. This is a distance equals uh, the rate of speed times a time problem. So distance equals rate of speed times time. That's what this problem really is. It comes down to distance equals rate times time. We are dealing with two groups of people. The first family and the second family. Okay. Here's what we know. I'm just going to make a little box here. Oof. Let's try that one more time. Okay. We know the distance will equal the rate of speed times the time. We also know their distances are 455 miles per hour. Uh, sorry, 455 miles. Both of them travel 455 miles. We also know the first family drove five miles per hour faster than the second family. We don't know how fast the second family drove. So I'm just going to say they drove the rate of speed of R. And that means the second family drove 5 miles per hour faster, so that's R plus 5. Time. That's the only thing left we have to fill in here. The time. We know that the second family took a half an hour longer than the first family. We don't know how long the first family took, so I'm just going to call that T. And I know the second family took a half an hour longer than that. So we'll say that's T plus one half. Okay, we have two equations and two unknowns. We can solve this. First equation. 455 equals R plus 5 times time. That is their equation. The second family's equation is 455 equals their rate of speed times their time, which is t plus 1 half. OK, we're nearly there. Well at least in terms of setting it up, we're nearly there. We have two equations. We just need to figure out how are we going to solve these. The first equation, we could solve for t and then plug it into the second equation. So that's one option. Solve the first equation for t and then plug that into the second equation, and then we could solve for r. The other option is solve the second equation for r, and then plug that into the first equation, and then we would solve for t and back substitute to get the actual value of r. I think I'm going to go with the first option. So hang on tight. Let's get this going. All right, so I've given myself a little bit more space here, and I think I am going to solve the first equation for t, and then whatever I get for t, I'm going to plug it into the second equation. So, number one, 
let's solve for t. All right, 455 equals r plus 5 times t. The good part about this is that it's relatively simple to solve for t because all I need to do is divide the right-hand side by r plus 5. What I do to the right-hand side, I need to divide by the left-hand side as well, r plus 5. All right, so now we know what t equals. t equals 455 over r plus 5. So we know T. Now that we know T, let's go ahead and plug this value into the second equation. So here's our new number 2. 455 equals R times our new T value which is 455 all over r plus 5 plus 1 half. Okay, let's take a look at what we have now. It is quite complex, but it is solvable. What I would like to do is using the parentheses I want it under one fraction. I think this will help us a little bit in terms of solving this. So I'm just going to do common denominator and add those two fractions together. My common denominator is going to be 2 times r plus 5. Okay, 2 times r plus 5. Okay, so I need a 2 times r plus 5 here, and a 2 times r plus 5 on our second term. And then that will give us common denominator and C. Actually, I don't need to do that part. I actually just need to multiply this first fraction because it already has the r plus 5. I just need to multiply that one by 2. 2 over 2, because 2 over 2 is just a nice little 1. So 2 over 2. And for the second fraction, it needs the r plus 5. And we'll do r plus 5 over r plus 5. And that is a nice one. Okay, so this new parentheses will be Okay, so now that we have common denominator, it will be 455 equals r times, all under the same common denominator, of 2 times r plus s, r plus 5, pardon me. And we have 2 times 455, which is 910, plus, well, 1 times r plus 5 is r plus 5. Okay. We could add the a 910 and the 5 together. It's going to be 455 equals r times 915 plus r all over. Well, I'm going to go ahead and do that math of 2 times r is 2r, and 2 times 5 is 10. Okay, so now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get rid of that fraction by multiplying both sides by 
2r plus 10 and 2r plus 10. Once I do that, the fraction on the right will go away. And we are left with 455 times 2r plus 10 equals r. Well, that's not lining up very nicely. Let's move it down just a wee bit. Okay. See if that's the issue. Uh, okay, so we have 455 times 2r plus 10 equals r times 915 plus r. Okay, we're getting there. Now, I've got r's all over the place. I've got numbers all over the place. I'm going to go ahead and distribute. I'm going to get everything on one side. I'm going to factor and then see what I get. Okay. Distribute. 455 times 2r is 910r plus 455 times 10 is 4550. R times 950 is uh, 915 is 915 R and R times R is R squared. Okay, R squared is positive. So I'm actually going to move everything to the right um, to keep that R squared positive. So subtract 910 R, subtract 910 R. I'm left with 4,500 50 equals 5r plus r squared. I'm going to subtract the 4,550 from both sides. Oops. And that's going to give me 0 equals negative 4,550 plus 5r plus r squared. Okay, it's a little awkward, so I'm going to rearrange this, put everything on the left, uh, just switch the side of the zero and everything else. So r squared plus 5r minus 4,550 equals zero. Now with a little finagling, you will be able to factor the left-hand side r times r will give us r squared. We need two numbers fairly close together because when you uh, one's negative and one's positive that once you take the difference of these two numbers there's only five separating them and it turns out it's going to be 70 and 65. r minus 70 equals 0 and r plus 65 equals 0. And we're going to solve for these values of r. Add 70 to both sides. r equals 70. Remember, r is a rate of speed, so that's miles per hour. Subtract 65, subtract 65. r equals a negative 65 miles per hour. Can we have a negative speed? Well, mathematically it works out, but in reality, for the context of this problem, a negative speed doesn't make sense. So we found our speed of 70 miles per hour. And I'm going to scroll up. Our r was the rate of speed of the second family. r is the rate of speed of the second family. So the second Come on, pin. Second family drove 70 miles per hour. The first family 
drove, well, r plus 5, so that's 70 plus 5. So their speed was 75 miles per hour. There are the two speeds. Let's take a look at another problem. The current of a river is three miles per hour. It takes a motorboat a total of three hours to travel 12 miles upstream and return the 12 miles downstream. What is the speed of the boat in still water? Now, you may not ever go on a boat or you may not ever think of this problem and have to solve it in the future, but there are a lot of things in the world that um, takes into effect something going against you. So let's say it's a really super windy day and you're running into the wind. Well, that's going to be pushing against you and you're going to have to exert a lot more energy to race against the wind versus if the wind was at your back, then you can run a lot faster because the wind is actually helping you. Likewise, if you're in a plane and you have a headwind, which is going against you, versus a tailwind, it's going with you. Same thing in a car. Wind plays a very important um, matter in dealing with fuel economy. The other thing is when you're in a boat, well, what's playing against you there is not necessarily wind so much as the current of the river or current of the lake or current of the ocean. And it takes a lot more energy to go against the current than it does to go with the current. All right, so here's the important information. Number one, the current is three miles per hour. Okay, I'm just going to write that as C equals three miles per hour. Okay. We also know the distance the motorboat goes is 12 miles. Not only does it go downstream, upstream 12 miles, it also goes downstream 12 miles. And then we know that it takes that whole entire trip, the whole entire time, to travel uh, three miles both upstream and downstream. So let's put all this together. This is a distance time rate times time problem still. We have some speed up, upstream, and then we have downstream. We have some information. Okay, the distance in both cases is 12. We go upstream 12 and we come back 12 miles downstream. Now the distance will equal the rate of the speed times the time it takes. Now here's the thing. When you are going upstream, you are traveling against the current. The current is not helping you. In fact, it's hurting you. So your rate of speed is going to be your rate of speed minus the current. It's going against you. Likewise, or anti-likewise, if you're going downstream, the current is with you. It is helping you. So it's going to be your rate of speed plus the current is going to be your speed. All right, now, the time up and the time down are going to be two different times. For now, I'm going to label it time up and time down. Okay, so we're getting there. Now, let's also take in consideration, so that's going to be one, two, and this is going to be our third one. We also know our time up plus our time downstream. Let's do that right. Time down. Well, that whole trip takes three hours. We also know our current is three. So I'm going to uh, replace the C 
with our three miles per hour that we know our current is. Okay, if I solve, let's solve the first equation for time up, and then we'll solve the second equation for time down. And then we can plug them into our third equation and get something that we'll be able to solve. Okay. 12 equals r minus 3 versus the time up. Let's divide each side by r minus 3. Divide by r minus 3. So time up will equal 12 over r minus 3. Okay, we've got that so far. Similarly, we have for the time down, we have 12 equals r plus 3 times the time down. We're going to solve this for time down by dividing by r plus 3 on both sides r plus 3 on both sides, and we get 12 over r plus 3 will equal our time down. Okay, we have everything we need. We're going to use the third equation and plug in our time up and plug in our time down and solve for the equation. So in our third equation, it's going to be our time up 12 over r minus 3 plus our time down 12 over r plus 3 that equals 3. I just want to fix that parenthesis a little bit here so it looks more like a parenthesis to you. Okay. We have one equation, we have one unknown, we're going to solve for the rate of speed. All right, to get rid of those fractions, we're gonna uh, multiply both sides by the LCD. In other words, I'm actually going to multiply every term by the LCD. And the LCD is R minus three, R plus three. And I'm going to multiply that to each term. And finally, r minus 3, r plus 3. Okay, let's move that down so we have a little bit of space here. I'll use different color just to reduce things. All right, r minus 3 cancels out r minus 3. r plus 3 cancels out r plus 3. And here's what we've got left. Twelve times r plus three plus twelve times r minus three equals three times r minus three r plus three. Okay. Let's distribute. Add like terms. Simplify as much as possible. So twelve times r is 12r plus 3 times 12 is 36 plus 12 times r is 12r 12 times negative 3 is negative 36 and I'm going to do the um, two parentheses first uh, that's going to be r squared minus 9 I'm going to add like terms uh, the 36's will cancel and I have 24r equals 3r squared minus 27. All right, we are almost there. All we need to do is set this equal to zero, factor, and then we will solve. Okay, so I'm going to move everything to the right. So I'm going to subtract 24r subtract 24r. 0 equals 
Come on, pin. 0 equals 3r squared minus 24r minus 27. Now let's factor. First thing I can do is I can factor the 3, the, the GCF. I'm not sure why it's not writing there, so let me try over here. 0 equals 3r squared minus 24r minus 27. Let's factor out the 3, leaving us with r squared minus 8r minus 9, and that all equals 0. I'm going to go ahead and um, divide both sides by 3. And divide by 3. That will give us 0 equals, not the color I want, 0 equals r squared minus 8r minus 9. Let's factor. 0 equals r, r. Two numbers that multiply to negative 9 but add to a negative 8. That's going to be a positive 1 and a negative 9. Let's use the zero factor property. r minus 9 equals 0. And r plus 1 equals 0. For the first equation, let's add 9 to both sides. r equals 9. Let's subtract 1 from both sides. r equals negative 1. Now let's keep in mind that this is a rate of speed. Miles per hour, miles per hour. A boat can go 9 miles per hour. That is a good answer for this context. A boat cannot go a negative 1 mile per hour. Although mathematically correct, it is not valid for this particular context. Uh, context. All right, let's try another problem. And this is an inlet pipe drain problem. And it's kind of a, a cool way of thinking about it. Um, if you have, uh, you can even think of this as a faucet, faucet on versus water draining out. So uh, I know this is a pool, but I can't really draw a pool with a drain and uh, an inlet pipe. So I'm going to go ahead and just draw a tub. So let's say we have a pool, like a kiddie pool, and it has, oh, I don't know. We'll, we'll say that it has a um, pipe coming in, a hose. We'll say like a, you know, like a, a water hose coming in, and it's uh, filling up with water. Okay, that fills it up with water. And then likewise, uh, unfortunately, somebody forgot to do the plug and the plug is down here and uh, the water is seeping out as you fill it up. Okay, so as you're putting water in, it's also flowing out at the same time. Now, you if the drain was plugged, you could fill the pipe, you could fill this pool up in uh, 10 hours. So here's the water on the inside of the pool. You could fill up this pool in 10 hours. And if the pool was completely filled and you let the drain out, it would drain in 12 hours. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's say you leave them both open. So an inlet pipe, in other words, the hose can fill a pool in 10 hours while it takes the drain can empty the pool in 12 hours. If the pool is empty and both the inlet and the drain are open, how long will it take to fill the pool? First thing is, can we fill the pool? Yes, because it takes a shorter time to fill the pool than to empty the pool. So therefore, it will eventually fill up. Not too sure how long it will take, but it will certainly eventually fill up. Now, let's let x represent the time 
it takes to fill the pool. Yeah, fill the pool with uh, both the faucet on, I'm just going to call it the inlet and drain open. Okay, so that's how long it's going to take to actually do it. We don't know, but it will happen. So we want to know how much of the pool, if we only had the faucet running, but the plug um, in the drain, so nothing was coming out, how much of the pool would fill in one hour? Well, it takes 10 hours to fill it. So therefore, in one hour, it would be filled one tenth of the way because it takes 10 hours to fill it. And uh, in the second hour, it would be two tenths filled. Third hour would be three tenths filled. Fourth hour, four tenths filled. Uh, eighth hour, eight tenth filled. Nine hour, nine tenth filled. And in the tenth hour, ten out of uh, ten tenths would be filled. In other words, 10 over 10 is one. It's completely filled. Let's take that same idea and let's start with a field pool. How much of the pool would drain in one hour? Okay, we're starting with a filled pool. And if we just let the plug out and let it completely drain, it would take 12 hours. So in one hour, it would be drained one twelfth of the way. In the second hour, two twelfths. Third hour, three twelfths, and so on and so forth, until you get to the twelfth hour, and now twelve twelfths is drained. In other words, the whole entire pool is drained in 12 hours. Now, filling a pool is adding water. Draining the pool is subtracting water. Now, we have both of these things going on at the same time. So here's our equation. It takes one-tenth per hour to fill the pool. We have to subtract the one-twelfth of the pool that's leaving in the same hour. Well, how much of the pool is then filled in the one hour? Well, that's one X of the time that it takes when both of them are going at the same time. Okay, so let me repeat this. One tenth minus, so one tenth, which is the fill rate, minus the drain rate, which is one twelfth, will equal when both of them are doing after an hour. Now that we have our equation, oops, now that we have our equation, we can solve for x. Okay, let's find common denominator. Well, I have a 10, a 12, and an x, and I want to find LCD here. The LCD of 10, 12, and x, well, I definitely need a 12, I mean, I definitely need the x, and the LCD between uh, 10 and 12 is 60. So 60x is our LCD. I'm going to multiply each term by 60x so I can get rid of those denominators. 60x, 60x, and 60x. Okay. Well, 10 goes into 10 once, 10 goes into 60 six times. 
12 goes into 12 once, 12 goes into 60 five times, and x goes into x once, leaving 60. So here's our new problem. 6x times 1 is 6x minus 5x times 1 is 5x. 60 times 1 is 60. Well, 6x minus 5x is 1x, and x equals 60. In fact, 60 hours. The pool will fill, but it will take 60 hours to fill it if you leave both the pipe on and off at the same, or the, the water coming in and the drain letting it out at the same time. 60 hours to fill. Let's take this rational function and graph our function. Okay, so there's a couple of ways how we can conquer this. The first thing I wanna do is I want to find the y-intercept. Okay, the y-intercept is when x equals zero. The second thing I wanna graph, well, is the x-intercept. Well, that's when y equals zero. And then, because the x is in the denominator, we also need to figure out what is the vertical asymptote. If we have a horizontal asymptote, we'll also figure that out. Okay, so we need to figure out these four things, and then we can go from there to try and figure out what this graph looks like. All right, let's figure out the y-intercept. Well, that's when x equals 0, so y equals 0 minus 4 over 0 minus 2. That's negative 4 over negative 2. And, well, negative cancels out the negative, and that leaves us 2. Our y-intercept is at 2. Let's check our x-intercept. Okay, well, 0, when y is 0, that's going to be x minus 4 equals x minus 2. We can multiply both sides by x minus 2. Oops, x minus 2. Well, x minus 2 times 0 is still 0, so that gives us 0 equals x minus 4. Let's add 4 to both sides. 4 equals x. So we know it crosses where x is 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, we know those two points. We are not connecting the dots yet. Hold on, we're not connecting the dots. What we do also need to figure out is the vertical asymptote. The vertical asymptote is when the denominator is zero. So x minus two, when does that equal zero? Well, when x equals two. Well, x equals two is a line. So here is our asymptote at x equals zero, or x equals two, pardon me. Now horizontal, asymptote is we're going to kind of um, guesstimate where it is. What we're going to do is choose a huge number for x and figure out what happens. Okay, so I'm just going to select 10,000 for x. Of course it's not on my graph, but I'm going to see when I get a really, really, really big number, what happens to my function. Okay, y equals, and I said 10,000, you can use any big number, minus 4, all over 10,000, minus 2. Uh, well, 10,000 minus 4 is uh, 9,996, 
all over, well, 9,998. Well, that is super duper close to one. It's in fact, the larger our number gets, the closer and closer and closer it is to one. It will never be one, but it will be very close to one. So the horizontal asymptote is y equals one. Okay, so where y equals one is our horizontal asymptote. We will not cross this horizontal. Likewise, we will not cross our vertical. Okay, now I just have to figure out some points. I'm just going to create a little table over here. My x's and my y's, and I'm going to start plugging in some values. Maybe I'll do a negative 1, a 0, a 1, a 2, um, a 3, a 4, a 5. Okay, now, when x is negative 1, you can do the math the long way. I'm just going to give you the values. When x is negative 1, we have 5 thirds. When x is 0, we have 2. When x is 1, it is a 3. When x is 2, the denominator becomes a 0, so it's undefined. When x is 3, we get a negative 1. When x is 4, it's a 0. And when x is 5, it's a 1 -third. These are points that we can plot. All right, so let's try it. Negative one and five thirds. Well, that's nearly two. It's uh, one and two thirds. So a negative one and almost a two thirds. A one and two thirds. So that's about here. It's very close to there. A zero and two we already plotted because that's our intercept. A one and three. And in fact, the closer I get the 2, the closer it goes running off to uh, positive infinity. So here's our graph. We'll start to get the sense of what these graphs look like on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, 3 and negative 1. 1, 2, 3, and negative 1. 4 and 0 we already had and 5 and 1 third is just slightly above the line. And again, it's this nice curvy shape. It never touches those red lines, but it comes very, very close. All right. That is it for this lesson. So until next time, be seeing you.